My name is Melanie Dizon. I'm the Director of Education at the Davis Finney Foundation. And today we are here for our Living Well webinar series. And we're gonna be talking about living alone with Parkinson's. Uh, one thing that I wanna talk about in terms of living alone is that some people will say, I'm single living with Parkinson's or I live alone. What we're really focusing on right now is people who live in their home by themselves uh, they might not necessarily be single. Maybe they have a partner who lives in another place, but we're talking about people who live by themselves, no roommate, no family member, no spouse, no partner. Um, and uh, because we really want to, <laughs> Diana Dunn, thank you for the haircut. Yes, I got one. Uh, we want to talk about what those challenges are. So it has nothing to do with relationship status. It has to do with sort of our living situation. And then I also want to just thank our uh, peak partner sponsors today. Uh, we have four peak partners, and these are companies that are invested in the Davis Finney Foundation and what we do um, globally. So they get to sponsor not just our webinars, but um, some our EVC, our Sorry Every Victory Counts Manual, a lot of the content that we create on our blog. These are very um, people that we collaborate with greatly. Uh, those sponsors, our peak partners are Adamus, Amniel, Lundbeck, and Synovian. And we're so grateful to them to be able to host these webinars and have amazing people on. So thank you so much to our sponsors. Uh, okay, let's get started. We have so much to talk about. This is a fabulous topic. We've had so many people in, um, ask us, why are we not covering this topic? There's so many people that are living on their own and they feel a little bit um, left out of the conversation, you know, especially when care partners uh, topics get brought up because they're, they're their own care partner and they're not really addressed. So looking forward to talk about this. Uh, somebody's asking real quick, how do I turn off closed captions? If you, there should be a little arrow on the bottom of your uh, dashboard, your Zoom dashboard, it says CC. And if you click that little arrow, you'll see something that says hide subtitles. So you can just click that and it'll, it'll turn off. Okay, um, we, we were supposed to have another person on, on the panel and I really hope she shows up, She's having a little bit of trouble uh, with the Zoom link. So we hope to welcome her in a minute, but um, don't be just, don't worry if she, if someone pops up in the middle and nothing. Okay, so I'd love to go around and I'm gonna start with Allison. And if you could just tell us um, your name, where you live, how long you've been living with Parkinson's why this is an important topic to you and why you said yes when I reached out. And then also like, how long have you been living alone with Parkinson's? So if you happen to have been diagnosed when you were with somebody and then, you know, now you're living alone. So go for it, Allison. Thank you, Mel. My name is Allison Kinney. I live in Brantford, Connecticut, and I was diagnosed in 2014, um, which is almost eight years ago. And, um, I was diagnosed shortly after my husband passed away. And um, I felt this was a very important topic for me to participate in because um, I have been living alone ever since I was diagnosed. But having said that, I felt from the get-go that it was very important to fight. And um, I've been very, very cognizant of the things that I have to be aware of in the house. Um, and in order to live well with Parkinson's. So um, I try to talk to other people and make that impression on pe other people with Parkinson's so that we are not having issues in the house that are caused by living alone. So thank you very much, Mel. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sharing. Mike, how about you? My name is Mike Fanning. I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. I was diagnosed in 2001, 20 years ago. Um, I think living alone can sound simple in the beginning, but it can become complicated as life goes on. And so I think there's some things that you don't think about that you have to concern yourself with. As Allison said, you know, trying to simplify your lives and trying to just understand that living alone is just is, is, can be complicated. So uh, I've been living alone for six years now. Thank you. Brian. Um, my name is Brian Reedy. I was diagnosed with uh, Parkinson's in uh, early 2011. Um, I had my care partner, Lily, with me until 10 months ago. 
uh, when she died from metastatic breast cancer. So we were each other's care partner and in a way that kind of helped my Parkinson's uh, be more cognitively aware, but at the same time, I let my physical go because I was, it's hard to take care of yourself when you're taking care of someone who's in worse shape. Um, and uh, so, so I'm only 10 months into this living single, but it's interesting. I, I, Lily and I have led our support group here in Carson City for years. And um, I've learned so much, just what's available in the community, what we can connect with. Uh, I had where I had help coming in for a while until I could make the adjustment. Uh, people coming in to help me with meals and, and stuff. And I did meals on wheels or meals at the community service, uh, uh, community center, I mean, senior, senior center. <laughs> um, so it, I love sharing what I've learned to help others who are struggling with similar things. And, and I, I just want to be a benefit with the experiences that I'm having. Great. Thanks so much, Brian. Michael. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Fitz. I'm from the great state of Alabama. Um, I have been diagnosed with Parkinson's ever since July the 5th, 2011. Um, I also have been living alone all that time and probably before that, because actually, you know, people say that when you get diagnosed with Parkinson's, you likely have had it at least a decade prior to the diagnosis. So I've been living alone all that time. And I really think this is an important subject. And I know when I originally talked to Mel about it, she was like really, really excited because, um, you know, she was putting stuff together to, to address this particular situation. Um, so I'm excited to be here. Great, thanks, Michael. Jerry, glad you could join us. Oh, thank you. <laughs> nice to see everyone. Uh, I'm Jerry. I'm currently in Philadelphia. I am a single woman by choice, always have been. And when I was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2015, I was barely 50. So, um, and as Mike said, you, you have symptoms before your official diagnosis. So interestingly, I was being treated for uh, back, injury, back pain and it resolved in short order, but I had a foot drag and a weird arm swing. And when I went back to my family medicine doc, who said, um, first thing he said to me, how's your back? I'm like, the back's great. We resolved it with physical therapy and rehab and a little pain injection, no problem, but watch me walk. And then he said, you're onto something. Cause I was as young probably as his daughter. He graduated med school the year I was born. And from there, um, February 3rd, 2015, a day that will live in my infamy. That's when I was diagnosed. And I'm so honored to talk about this because being relatively young with Parkinson's, the resources were geared to a different age group. So I've been able to cultivate uh, an early onset women's group support group for young women with early onset Parkinson's. So this is great. And some live alone, some have partners, some work, some don't work. So this is super important. So thank you. I'm honored to meet all of you. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, okay, what I wanna start out with is uh, really positive. What is your very favorite part about living alone with Parkinson's? Anybody wanna chime in? <laughs> Having yeah, all the time I knew you were gonna chime in. What? Having all the time in the world that I need to do all the things that you think should be easy, but sometimes are difficult, like bathing, grooming, dressing, buttoning, fastening, tying. And that's even before you have breakfast. <laughs> right. right, right. So you don't have so having somebody, time. Yeah, you don't have somebody yeah. trying to crack the whip and say, hurry up, hurry up, right? Or as, as a woman that cares about other people, if, if other people are in my space, I tend to care for them. I'll make the coffee or I'll, you know, serve the tea or whatever, whatever happens to be going. So the yeah. freedom of time is really helpful and space. Yeah. Anybody else want to share what they like about it? Well, I don't know if I like this, but, you know, I go back and forth between wanting company and then not wanting company. Mm -hmm. So basically after I've worked all day and going home, I really don't want to have to deal with a whole lot of questions because I answer questions at work all the time. So that sounds a bit selfish, but it's an honest answer. So I do, in some instances, like 
being single and um, living alone forever. Yeah. So what is it that you do? Um, you know, people want to people want to get a better sense of, of who we are. So what do you do uh, during the day? So I work I work at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, um, specifically the um, UAB libraries. And so there I serve as the assistant dean for user access, which is all of the services and um, things that and resources that we supply our faculty, staff and um, students. And then also I have a diversity um, appointment as well. Great. That's a big job, Mike. You're a busy yes. man. I wonder why you want some downtime when you get home. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> Anybody else? What are What is the silver lining of, of living on your own right now? Well, well, I will say that um, one of my issues is posture, and I'm always trying to make sure I'm standing up straight and not living with someone. This is, this is kind of funny. I don't have anybody here to nag me to stand up straight. I <laughs> nag myself. I go by a mirror. I go, whoops. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, somebody says, what I like about living alone is that it motivates me to confront my challenges. I can't just ask someone else to do what is difficult for me. That's yeah. A good answer. Great answer. Yeah. yeah, we all accommodate. We learn tricks. We have this way of, it's like that grit, that perseverance, that ability to just, well, it's on you, girl. You better do it. <laughs> you know? So yeah. that's a great point. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, one of the things that we hear often from care partners is that that um, dynamic where it, how, how much do I push the person to do stuff on their own? I, I want to help them out. And the other person says, well, the, the person will do it for me. And so, uh, you know, I think that 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 uh, problem solving has to be very, very uh, attuned when you're living by yourself. Um, so you have to learn how to get things done, or you also are very good at asking. Um, Brian, we know, Brian, you can't go on a ladder ever again. We're just not letting it happen. And so <laughs> if you need to make it happen, you gotta, you gotta call somebody. And so it kind of helps you build that network of people outside of the home. Uh, but I'd love to talk a little bit about the challenges of living alone. So what, what are some of the things that, you know, they can be big challenges, you know, sort of the global picture, but also the things in day-to-day -day life where you just, ugh, like every time I make my coffee or every time I want to do this, this is just gets in my way or it takes too long or that kind of thing. Well, actually I have a challenge as far as like getting dressed in the morning. And the, the, the main part of that that I have trouble with is like buttoning up my sleeves. And so sometimes yeah. I can do it and sometimes I can't. And then also I have a tendency to wear ties. Sometimes I can't, I can't tie my tie, which is kind of odd and it's frustrating because I know you see that I'm a very fashionable young man. You are. So that's, so so that's a, that. that can be a problem. Yeah. <laughs> that can be a problem. So what do you do? Either I just wrestle with it because sometimes it takes me like um, anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes. So a lot of times I'll leave it you know, leave it alone because I guess it's one thing to have your sleeve unbuttoned. It's another to have your pants or something unbuttoned. So, you know, <laughs> most people don't really pay attention to your sleeves. So. Right. Allison. I live in a three-story condo and one of my issues is laundry. My laundry is down in the basement and schlepping the laundry from the second floor to the first floor to the basement is a challenge. And the way I've gotten around it though is I have one of those mesh bags and I basically I only fill it up maybe two-thirds of the way and I throw it down the stairs <laughs> then I get downstairs and go down the next level but it works for me <laughs> great what do you do on the way up I walk very slowly one step at a time with my hand on the railing one hand holding the bag the other hand holding the railing great yeah and at least it makes it easier to drag than like a big you know a plastic bin like or that. something like that. Yeah. Um, someone says you can leave your ties tied and hang them in your closet that way. Ooh, hey. That's a good suggestion. Pretty darn smart. Okay, that's great. Brian. Um, so me being kind of new to this, um, early on, because my grief and depression were bad, I found I wasn't doing my medications well. I wasn't doing a lot of things well, drinking water and all that. So uh, being a, a former school teacher, I, I made a a checklist thing for me. Uh, 
for everything. And this really helped. And I, I kept it at a prominent place in the kitchen. And um, I, I found that probably within about uh, six weeks, I didn't need it anymore because oh, I had great. gotten it to a routine. What are and, some, can you share, share some of the things that are on that list? Yeah. That's so brilliant, it has, Brian. Um, it is. I had to do my excellent patch, uh, my asthma inhaler uh, and allergy inhaler because they're all in the back. My meds are out here in the kitchen table. Uh, I had to remind myself to go back and do those. Oh, and eye drops too. And then glasses of water. I found I was having a lot of health issues and most of them were because I wasn't drinking enough water. Mm. Uh, so I started to have check marks for that. And then some of my physical therapy, the stretching, go outside. Uh, with the depression, I wasn't going outside at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it was pretty severe depression. Uh, Miralax, did, ride the Peloton. Did writing, back did writing it down make you go outside? Oh yeah. That is that's so great. Yeah, yeah, and and it, it, you know, having people to talk with through the depression, but to to have those checks to kind of it's a positive affirmation at the same time. Um, so you know, even people probably who've been. Um, alone for a long time, you I would assume there's times where life changes, you have more physical challenges and you kind of lose your momentum or your, uh, your, your daily things and, and other things might take you off course. So that's what helped me. I mean, for everybody, it's different. Um, but it, yeah, that definitely helped. That's great. Jerry, I, I shared some yeah. of Mike's um, challenges about buttoning and, you know, this is a purely gender issue, but the hooking and positioning correctly of one's bra is very challenging. And when I get stuck, um, I found accommodation. There's a little button holder you can buy, like the way they put spats on back in the teens and the 20s and the 1800s. It's like a little button holder that helps. And taking a break from it. If I'm I'm really struggling with some job, I'll just, okay, go on to the next thing, give myself a breather and go back to it. And I garden, I'm an avid gardener. That's part of my physical therapy. So some days I just have to give my permission to remember it's not you, it's the Parkinson's. You're not, you're slow because of the Parkinson's. Take your time because slow and steady wins the race, right? Yeah, mm. absolutely. Well, and, and so you, yeah. I was gonna say, if I can chime off what Jerry said, because what she said is really key that I've noticed myself is you give yourself permission to, you know, not do something or, or to uh, adjust things and just not be hard on yourself for it. And I, yes, I give yourself really that, key. like, it's okay. It's not yeah. you, it's your Parkinson's because it's, we're all, everybody manages something and, you know, we just gotta feel good about what we accomplish every day. Sometimes I have a list of 10 and I get to one and I feel good, you know, yeah. so it's been a good day. I got one thing done and other days I can do five of the 10. So it's right. really uh, managing your expectations and knowing that it's, it's all good. Everything gets done in divine order. So we're all fine. Right. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Mike. It's a complicated issue because, you know, you, you get the freedom of space and the freedom to do the things you want to do when you want to do them and, and, the, and the, and the feel feeling of success when you accomplish those things. But as a good friend of mine told me, you know, you want to try to be as independent as you can be. But when, but when you go out to see them, they want to help you out. And, and for you to be independent and not want the help, that's how they show their love. They show their love by wanting to help you. And so you have to be able to be, able to be humble enough to say, yes, I'll accept the help. Whether they open a door for you or they, they do whatever, you know, but, but that's how they show their love. So it's just trying to find out what that balance is going to be. How, how can you be independent, but yet be able to be vulnerable? enough to let people help you when, when they want to help you out because that's how they, that's how they show they care. Yeah, absolutely. That's, the, that's something um, somebody said, my biggest challenge was learning to ask for help. Who do I trust to help? Who do I know? Uh, sorry. Who do I know who wants to be involved in my life? I'd love to talk to you guys a little bit about your relationship with asking for help. Is this something you all feel comfortable doing that you struggled with? What have you learned along the process? Brian. Uh, I, I, I love the way Mike described that, you know, that you have to be willing to be vulnerable and let people in. Uh, and I've always, with my family, at least, I've always tried to project, I'm fine with Parkinson's. Look how I'm doing this and that. And I've never let them see the hard times. And it's not so much intentional. It's just never happened. And after Lily died, I had to 
have somebody come and help me. And my sister came and I just cried like a baby because she saw how bad it could get. She saw how uh, devastating things can be with this. And she was the first person besides Lily who had seen that. And she says, she kept telling me, it's okay, this is good. You know, you need to let more of us see this kind of thing. So that's why Mike's work is really struck. But I think the more we can be honest with ourselves and let people in that we feel we can trust, they'll honor that trust and they'll feel gracious that you've let them in. Um, it's, it's something that we have to get better at and kind of drop the ego and the pride and open the heart. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody Parkinson's else? has a way of dissolving all ego. Yeah. My, short, <laughs> my short experience with this long progressive experience of Parkinson's, yeah, it dissolves it. And building a good care team where they understand I will ask for help when I need it. Um, just because you see me struggle doesn't mean I need your help. It means I want to work through that task and get to that end point. So, and then, and just as Brian, as you said, being the gracious recipient of saying, yes, please help me. It's, it's great. Yeah, team building has been a really good thing in helping me manage my solo existence with Parkinson's. And so I do wrestle going back and forth about asking people for um, assistance. And I kind of, this is going to sound awful, but I, I really don't mean any harm. So I have some people that are around me, I have them trained to kind of like make sure that they're kind of like looking at me, you know, not just staring, but like looking at me, seeing if I need any help. Because I mean, it is an online experience. It really is. And, you know, you try to be as independent as possible, which is another reason I live alone. But you have to keep in keep in mind some of those other things that go along with it. So it can really, really be tough. Yeah. Especially when people, um, I'm sorry, Allison, I'm gonna be quiet after this. Especially <laughs> when people, <laughs> um, especially when, okay, I lost my train of thought. I shouldn't have interrupted you. That's okay. <laughs> well, you just tell us when you, when you get it back. Okay, thank you. Allison? Um, yeah, before my husband passed away, I used to have this thing called the honey-do list. You know, and you make a list of things that you want to get done around the house. Well, I still have the honey-do list, but I don't have anybody to take care of those items. So I enlist um, some of my friends and neighbors to, and my, uh, one of my daughters who lives in the state. And uh, they'll come and visit me once in a while. I'll cook them a nice meal and uh, they'll take care of some of the items on my honey-do list. Um, I'm not too proud to ask for help on, you know, especially on things that require you know, balance or getting on a step stool or anything like that. It's like I write it down and somebody will get it done if I ask them nicely. <laughs> yeah. I have one of those, it's called my Jerry do list. <laughs> That's good. Um, okay, so I did remember what I was gonna say. I remember okay. what I was gonna say and it's really Great. quick. So in answering that question too, and having the ability or having to rush, I mean, decide whether you wanna ask for help or not, so it's even tougher when people say, you don't look like you have Parkinson's. Mm. Mm. Right. So what, I mean, what do, you, what do you say after that? It's just- I ask the question, what do you think a person with Parkinson's looks like? Oh, wow, that, I, love, I love that. Turn it around, because it. if you look at me, I don't look like right. You know your standard stereotype. And that's the education part. We got to help our community by help engaging others when people say wow you don't I'm like well, what do you think and I, I always turn it around because I want to understand any misunderstandings under I want to clarify any bias um, and I really want to illuminate that it's not what you think it's like a snowflake right if there's a hundred people with mm -hmm. Parkinson's maybe they you've met one and everyone is an ind individual person just like a snowflake so it's a and great we don't conversation all have the same starter. symptoms say again mike it's a great conversation starter that's for sure yes. yeah, yeah it's true. i mean marketing i mean uh parkinson's has suffered from a marketing problem right uh it's it, the messages have have not really landed that it's anybody can get parkinson's it can be 30 yeah years old. Uh, i heckled so my guy my when i got diagnosed i heckled the doctor because i thought how can i have Parkinson's. I'm not 50. I'm a lifelong athlete. You're a movement disorder specialist. Do you really need a new patient? And he looked at me like, wow, no one's ever said that to me. Put his pen down and said, well, you can get a second opinion. And a little tear rolled out of my eye because I realized, oh, you are my second opinion. 
Mm. So then I composed myself. And now I'm here speaking with you lovely people today. <laughs> Somebody um, had a great, uh, it is critical to find the balance between giving over, accepting help, but not giving up. Yes, absolutely. I think that um, you, you guys let me know, but when you're, when you're living alone, you, you probably err on the side of, I'm going to do more than, than I probably should in some situations, because you just have to make, you just have to do it. You just have to get it done. Uh, but I would love to know if any of you have somebody that comes in on a regular basis that, that you've hired that are part of your care team that are taking care of some of these uh, daily living tasks that, that are difficult for you. Um, aside from, you know, uh, like Allison, you said you have a family member and some friends. What about the rest of you? I do not, but I will shortly because I'm preparing for left shoulder repair. Yeah, so <laughs> right. actually, Jerry, I would love for you to tell us a little bit about that because that is a, this was a big, this is a big situation happening for you. And a lot of oh, it yes. came from, you know, being on your own and you don't have the person to advocate. So can you tell us a little bit about what's going on? Sure. So um, I earned this shoulder injury. I used to surf in Hawaii where I live for 15 years, either before or after work and twice on Sunday. So I have a little bit of a tear that's now so painful. It has to be surgically repaired. I live alone. I have Parkinson's. It's a very straightforward or arthroscopic surgery, minimally invasive. The surgery is easy. It's the aftercare that's so um, strict. I'll be eight weeks in a sling. The first four weeks, I think it's 23 hours in a sling with an hour to groom and bathe and so forth. And then oh. the following four weeks, it's 12 hours. And then I can start rehabilitation for the shoulder. But as we know, I have occupational therapy, physical therapy, exercise every single day because that's how I keep my Parkinson's well-managed, exercise and diet, my key. So I've had to train the surgeon and his staff that, yeah, I'm gonna need wound care, occupational therapy, physical therapy for those eight weeks of my confinement. And they say, well, you're, it's only four little wounds. You won't need wound care, I say. Surgery on the left side, left hand dominant. Parkinson's on the right side. I have 10% fine motor skills. There's no way I'm doing adequate wound care. And they're like, oh, I've had to tell, I've had to repeatedly tell this to all different people and not only just surgical team people, but people that currently do my physical therapy at the Penn Parkinson Center here because I have to make them understand, no, this isn't for post-operative shoulder rehab. This is actually to manage my day to day while I have limited upward quadrant mobility. So I booked this, these, uh, I had my pre-op meeting on May 5th and I booked the surgery for the 29th of June because I knew I was gonna need a couple months of training and advocating and getting all these pieces and parts, hiring a housekeeper, getting Team Jerry for the, the bathing, the cooking, the tidying up, those sort of things. And the, the surgical schedule is like, well, we can see you in two weeks. I'm like, you don't understand. Parkinson's a lot more complex than you think. So it's a work in progress. Uh, I've had every day as a hurdle, but the first hurdle was helping the medical clearance scheduler know at my family medicine office that it has to be within 30 days. I can't come in 40 days. It has to be 30 days. It's, it's just, so it's really, oh, and I'm a, I'm a patient advocate and a research advocate as my advocacy for my community in Philadelphia and is how I support my community. So now I usually advocate for other people in these situations. I'm learning to advocate for myself. I've actually had to get my social worker at my movement disorder specialist, my Medicare specialist that helps me manage my um, annual selections because I am on social security disability. I no longer am able to work and I have Medicare. So it's, it's like knowing who your resources are, reaching out to them and Brian, I think I'm going to make that checklist because I love a good checklist, you know, and just so I have a visual reminder of all the pieces. It's a lot of bits and bobs, but I'm confident that as I progress on this path, it's going to be a great outcome because I'm going to do everything I can in my power because I know my surgeon's one of the best in the world. He's going to do everything in his power to make a perfect outcome because a year from now, I want to be able to lift my arm above my head. Right. Yeah, that's a lot. Well, that, that's it. That's a lot of work. And 
you know, good for you for not just backing down and, and having some of that experience to advocate for others to say, Thank oh, you, I know what's coming. This is, this is an end. You do have to, um, you have to educate a lot of people in the medical community that a lot of people, you know, don't really think that they need to do. So yeah, that's super helpful. Um, well, Brian, yeah. One thing Jerry mentioned that, that I, I've learned is really essential. She mentioned the social worker. Uh, and we've got such great social workers these days. Everybody looks at them as the people who separated kids and parents and all that. It's like, whoa, no, way different, super way different. Uh, and so because I'm a retired disabled vet, um, I get the VA stuff. And so I have a social worker there who helped me line up the care that was coming in when I first needed it. Uh, she got me the life alert. So if I fell, I'd hit the button. Uh, she just set up everything. And we had conversations for the future uh, and involved my kids in that and stuff. So social workers are an absolute blessing to have. And they'll, they will guide you to grants. They will guide you to things that you can get that you wouldn't even think of. So yeah. Can you actually talk a little bit about, um, so you had obviously your wife passed away and then that, that immediate time afterwards, uh, she, your social worker helped you. What were some specific things that, that you needed help with that you got some in, in-house help with? Well, thank you. Uh, yeah. And they, um, and actually my first social worker was through the hospice care for my wife. So she helped me for some time afterwards. Uh, and the thing that I needed the most was I was not eating. I, I Lily and I, as she was getting weaker from the metastatic breast cancer, uh, and she was eating less. I just started eating less and we ended up on the same sleeping schedule. You know, it's that kind of love of your life thing and you're just kind of glued together. Um, so when she was gone, it's like, okay, I'm not eating and uh, I've got depression and I'm just not caring to cook the meals. You know, I know how to cook, didn't want to. Um, and so they got me a team to get, get me talking about the disability. They, the VA helped with that. But the hospice social worker got me um, Meals on Wheels right away, which then later on I found out I shouldn't have been put on Meals on Wheels because that's if you can't get to the senior care center or senior center, which I could. So anyway, but that got me uh, a meal every day and, and meals over the weekend. And that helped me at least start getting more nutritious. And, and then I saw how bad the food was and that I really needed to cook. Um, because it was real, it wasn't bad food. It was just real carb heavy meals. And that's not great for us. Um, uh, so it was that, and then they, she helped me get a uh, team of people in here. And that's when she connected with the VA and with the VA social worker, uh, they allowed me to have um, two hours a day, um, four days a week, help come in and, mm -hmm. or five days a week. And that was amazing. Uh, and, and that just helped me when I wasn't ready to do things for myself. So they were doing the meal prep. Uh, they were doing the cleaning. They were helping me sort my meds, which we found out later they weren't supposed to. But <laughs> when you have 26 pills a day and- yeah. you know, Sometimes you, you need a little help. <laughs> all that, yeah, you need a little help. So, uh, so it was all those things. And, and so to have all that taken care of and to, to have the ability to wean off of that and get to my own strengths again. Uh, it made the transition much more possible and I, I think kept me out of a lot of trouble. Yeah, that's great. Um, I just wanna go through a couple of comments here. We've gotten a lot. Um, somebody said, let's see. Oh shoot. Um, trouble. While you're searching, can I comment? Finding a social worker or support is really easy in my city because we have a we have a great resource in several hospitals and there's centers of excellence but if you're in a rural community and you're a little farther out the davis finney foundation the parkinson's foundation the michael j fox foundation all these have resources where you can connect online in your local communities and it's so important that we share with our communities these actual resources not just webinars but you know, sharing that, like the VA has a great system. Not everyone knows that. In Philadelphia, one of the leading Parkinson's doctors at the Philadelphia VA, and he's also a master nutritionist because he believes, John Duda, MD, believes nutrition will save you, will help slow your progression. And so 
and and even your family medicine doctor, not your MDS, my movement disorder specialist wrote a grant, I believe, and they got the funding for their social worker. But before that, you could go to family medicine and they could help find you resources. So mm. it's not always just specific to the Parkinson's community. It can be general services within the healthcare community. Right. And uh, we did a webinar with John Duda. Oh, up thing. It's all about nutrition. Um, Somebody says, tip for Jerry, cami tops with shelf bra that you can step into versus struggling with a bra post-surgery uh, is a good idea. This is a- uh, oh, Wait, wait, wait. Read that again. That went by really fast. Say that again. Cami please. tops with shelf bra that you can step into versus- Oh, yeah. Struggling. I was thinking duct tape for eight weeks, but that's probably <laughs> a better idea. <laughs> um, someone says, I think living alone with Parkinson's encourages me to be more active. And when I compare myself to other people with Parkinson's that I know, the difference is shocking. They're far more debilitated than I am. I still make stilling silver gemstone jewelry and more functional um, than some people who rely on, who have the luxury of relying on a, a live-in care partner for sure. Uh, someone keeps a checklist by a, um, their Evernote. Uh, let's see. I live alone, have, have been since 1997. I was diagnosed in 2015. I have a wonderful family and friends. I'm always asking for help because I can't drive anymore, which brings up the question another person had asked, is anybody here dealt with this, the thought of uh, not driving anymore? Has driving become a challenge? And is this something that you're worried about for the future? Michael. So I have thought about that. That's a great question. Um, I can see some stuff already starting to happen when I drive. I already don't like to drive, but I don't really have an alternative because it's just me. You know, my parents live in Florida and my brother lives in another city and his wife. And I just really don't want to, I guess, burden them with that. And some days is worse than others. And I think most of the time um, it's dy dystonia. So it hits right. me and my, my, my Exactly. My feet like curl up and it's, mm -hmm. it, I can't even describe it, but it's painful. And it always happens when I'm driving. It doesn't happen every single day, but it, it happens on a fairly amount, you know, often schedule. Yeah. Right. And I don't like, I don't like driving at night, night either. Yeah. Does anybody here use, you know, Uber or Lyft or any ride share or anything like that? I do when I'm out of town, but. Yeah. Yeah. I, I use them when I travel. Um, one thing I've been looking into, uh, and this isn't always an option or affordability for everybody, but Tesla uh, has the uh, auto drive when you're on the freeway and then they're gonna have it uh, city and local, but it's like $10,000 to add it to the vehicle. Ooh. But that's something I'm considering because Lily did all the driving for all the years. So I've started driving now and, and I realize I'm not a great driver anymore. <laughs> uh, it's really, really hard to pay attention for long periods of time. Uh, yeah. So, um, so I'm looking into the Tesla, but at the same time, I also like riding my bike a lot. So the uh, recumbent is too difficult to take out to do local business stuff because it's so hard to lock down and, and worry about. But I have a mountain bike that uh, I'm going to convert to an e-bike and uh, oh. do my shopping maybe with some of that. Because uh, then you get the exercise and you get the ability to get out there. So those are thoughts I have. Yeah. Um, this is a, a really important question. I don't want to go too much longer without talking about it. How do, if you feel lonely, for those of you who this is, you know, lonely, Brian, I know this has been such a big deal. You know, you and Allison both lost your spouses. How do you deal with that loneliness? What do you do? Especially, I mean, especially today <laughs> in the situation we're in, but Allison? I think the, the support group I had was uh, a key you know, this being so fresh, just 10 months ago since she passed away, uh, um, I got a psychologist and a psychiatrist through the VA, you know, one to manage the meds and one to talk about it. Uh, and, and then I, a friend connected me with a great support group in Chicago where I grew up because there were none out here because they didn't think anybody could use technology. So they just stopped the groups. So I got on this phone one uh, in Chicago and it was just absolutely fantastic because when I thought, well, I can't share what I'm doing, I'm going to bring everybody down. And then somebody would share something similar. It's like, oh, okay, I guess I can. And, and you'd get it out there in the air and you'd find out, okay, I'm not so different. I'm not so weird. I'm not so uh, crazy. Um, so the support group, I think, helped a lot with that loneliness. And yeah. 
Um, was that a group that was uh, people who, you know, not with Parkinson's who like lost spouses or was it people? Correct. Yeah, it was just a loss of spouse. Anybody okay. who lost a spouse within the last year. Uh huh. Um, and, and it was just run through a hospice group. Uh, mm, yeah. My friend just happened to work with and, and got me in on, but you know, it should be, most of them should be doing that. Um, so that was one thing to help with the loneliness. But I think the other is um, once I, and I, I feel like Lily was guiding me from beyond, but once I found purpose, um, you know, and I, I saw the need to get back into our support group because we've had such loss through COVID uh, and the isolation and the negative effects of that. We lost five people in six months oh, in our small group of 30, that was 15 people with Parkinson's. So that's a third of our group. Uh, and I just felt I've got to get back. And coming back as an ambassador to Davis Finney gave me that purpose and, and it's kept me focused. It's where I have I think my greatest joy because I'm giving my struggles a benefit of helping others. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Allison. Uh, yeah, Brian, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, for me, when I was first diagnosed, there were no support groups in my local area and there were no Parkinson's specific exercise classes. So th those were two areas that I Went, went ahead and I, I searched long and hard and, and I actually started my own support group for Parkinson's and that's what has kept me energized and grounded and connected. Uh, the combination of my support group and the um, exercise classes that I've been participating in. You know, throughout the past year, of course, they were mostly on Zoom, but luckily we just went back in person last week and it was so oh. awesome. <laughs> Was that just so great? Oh my goodness. It was just, we couldn't hug or anything. We had to wear masks, but it was so great to share the same space and doing burpees again. Oh my God. <laughs> Who would have thought? That's, uh, you'd never be excited about doing burpees again in person. I'm still uncoordinated. I can't do those. I just, <laughs> it just, it's just kind of weird. Yeah. If I can finally figure out how to make my body do that, <laughs> impressive. Uh, someone else talked about companionship with, and I, Brian, I know, Brian, you have a lot of experience with this, and a couple people mentioned it, with service dogs. Can you talk a little bit about um, your, your experience with service dogs? So yeah, I, um, well, Lily and I had had two border collies, and I, I just love border collies. And we they were both rescues. And the lady who rescued them had a face on po had a post on Facebook uh, about four years ago about this these puppies she'd rescued, and that they were the smartest and um, gentlest puppies she had ever had. And I said, Lily, we have to have one. And she said, Why? And I said, Service dog. <laughs> I just kind of made it up just because I wanted another dog. Um, but then I trained him. So I have a friend who does guide dogs for the blind. Uh, and he taught me stuff and he showed me where uh, resources are online. And uh, it's very hard for a person with Parkinson's to, to do this. Um, but uh, I, I managed to do it for at least the key things. Um, but it got harder because you're not supposed to let your service dog be pet when they're working. Um, but when we'd go to the cancer ward and people would see Dempsey and they were getting this horrible stuff put in their veins, it's like, I, I can't say no. So he's not the greatest service dog in that sense. Um, but then what I found is some friends uh, heard about the troubles I've been having since Lily passed and how he's gotten a little bit of that spoiled. And, uh, and so they're going to raise a service dog for me and they're professionals. Uh, oh, but this is $30,000 cost. Wow. But they will That's raise beautiful. the dog for a year. I'll be a part of the training. And then at the end of the year, it'll be my dog. And I'll help pick them out, out of the litter. They'll, they know my, the way I am. And so they'll find a puppy to help address those needs. And then they'll give me a choice of the last two wow. um, that they narrow it down to. Um, but those are the two avenues. By yourself is, is more difficult. And you've got to be, you, you really need help with that. Um, but it's totally possible. Uh, you know, I could do it again. This time I just wouldn't spoil them as much and really follow the rules they give you with, uh, or else just pay the way, which is really hard uh, yeah. for a lot of people to afford. But yeah, we've done, I see the we've need done for it. Yeah, we've done a lot of um, information on service dogs. We actually have a two session uh, profile of Dempsey and Brian. So yeah. we will put the information up, and there's also, you know, links there to for people to learn more about it. Um, 
it is well, here, it is unfortunately not an easy thing to do but uh we know we know a lot of people that are the, the biggest benefit I, I i couldn't travel without him I, I couldn't get off an airplane without him uh there's just no way or when i go shopping you know i have a cart but he likes to push the cart so he gets me to move faster and gets me more exercise and then i have to exercise him and that gets me more exercise and yeah. the biggest payoff is the, nobody can give you outside of a spouse, nobody can give you the love a, a dog can uh, because it, that it does, they don't care if you said something bad, they still love you. No matter what. You got right? the biscuits. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll work for food. Um, They're so yeah, sweet. Says, I have a German Shepherd service dog that is a lifesaver, we company. I trained him myself too. I have friends who walk him. You can do it yourself. Yeah, excellent. And Dempsey's in a shelter right now. I had to, my father's on hospice. So I was just back home taking care of him and I just got home. So after this, I get to go pick up Dempsey. So I can't oh. show him to you now because he's first time ever in four years we've been apart. Oh, uh, so he's I'm anxious gonna be the to happiest little boy in the world today. Oh my gosh, yeah. So great. Um, what, are, what are some things that you are concerned about for the future, if anything, and are there are there any plans that you put in place uh, now for the future? Oh yes, indeedy. Okay, Jerry, let's hear it. So I'm very pragmatic. <laughs> um, long before I was ever diagnosed with uh, Parkinson's, I had set up my will, trust, and all those advanced directives that you know now it's oh. <laughs> So maybe 16 years ago. And every year I review it because I have specific um, plans for when I go, uh, if I become incapacitated. So I think it's really important for us to look at, and I'm sure Brian, you've had to face this more than you've ever wanted to, that end of life's questions, how do you how do you want to go out if you're in the hospital? Who's going to be your advocate if you're incapacitated? Who has your your, your you know, medical advanced directive, what are your plans? Um, and I also um, am donating, I can't believe this, but somebody wants my brain when I'm gone. So for, to, I'm in the par PPMI, the Park Parkinson's Progressive Movement Initiative, um, the marker initiative. So when I'm gone after a lifetime of doing the testing every six months um, with that research, I will give up my brain and they can slice and dice and see if there was ever anything in between my ears. You never know. And so that I had to find the person in my life, a lifelong friend that I knew would execute these very hard things when time was come. And because it couldn't be my family. And every year we chat and, you know, I ask her the question. I just ask her in advance of the surgery. I said, okay, the surgery's coming up at the end of June, pretty straightforward. But if things go sideways, are you willing and prepared to execute these documents, which you have agreed to all these years ago? And I'm like, very serious, but, you know, and she's like, yes, I will. I'm like, and then we go right on to the next thing, because I also think keeping a sense of humor, and unfortunately I have a gala sense of humor, which I try and keep in check, but you know, nobody gets out alive. We got to figure out what we're going to do between now and then and make it fun and keep a sense of humor and just smell the flowers, love your family, be happy. Right. You know, it could be worse. <laughs> yeah. Anybody, anybody else, Mike? Um, I think my, my concern has been more about cognitive awareness rather than the rather than the physical part of it the physical limitations you know am i cognitively, cognitively uh strong enough to to make the right choices financially you know when you live by yourself you who else do you have to rely on who to, to double check or you may are you not hoarding are you not spending money where you shouldn't and that's my big concern i think so i've involved my financial planner so she's very involved with me and make sure that I'm doing the right things and I get my family involved also. But I think I'm more I'm more concerned with cognitive disability than than the physical limitation, yeah. I think. Mike, I have a question for you. You've had Parkinson's diagnosed for 20 years now? Yes. So that's that's like inspirational to me because that means in 20 years from now when I'm older, because <laughs> I'm not so old right now, I, I could be solid like you. But do you feel like you have slowly Parkinson's related cognitive deficiency, or do you think maybe it's just time? I think I think I've got some little bit of limitations, but you know, 
it, you, you don't know what you don't know. So, you, of course. You, so do you do, you do anything to, to like battle that? Like for me, I learned to use it to do the Sunday New York Times crossword puzzle. I do a puzzle I, a day. I learn languages. I look at art. I paint. I do lots of new things to st stimulate new connections in my brain. I do the same thing. Yes, I do. Good. And it, it's clearly it's working. So good. So, good on you. Well done. Well, and that's kind of the benefit of rock steady or physical therapist who's doing uh, force intensive uh, exercises where they're having you count backwards in, in threes from 99 uh, or asking you questions while you're doing something, which always frustrates me, but that's what they're doing is they're expanding your cognitive abilities. And um, when, when I was learning to become a teacher, I had to take a, a brain science class. And in there, they said that the more you can challenge yourself to learn things you've never done before. Uh, so like my dad did crossword puzzles, for him to do crossword puzzles to keep himself sharp wouldn't be the same thing. It would be more like doing Sudoku or doing jigsaw puzzles or something he hasn't done. You right. make more connections and your brain becomes more elastic. Um, but in, and what echoing what somebody else said, the exercise, exercise, exercise saved mm -hmm. my butt. Because the first, after four years of the disease, I was on a cane all the time. We were looking at a walker. We were looking at a chair to pick me up. And, uh, and, and now I can outwalk my brothers and I can, uh, I'm, I'm stronger in, in a lot of ways because I just love movement. I love action. I love being a part of it and learn that you don't have to give up. You just have to find the things you can do safely. Yeah. And around well, that cognitive piece, I mean, the other piece, are, you know, around that novel learning is that if you want to, you know, if you want to slow time down, do something novel. Uh, because it helps you kind of, it, it just slows down time. You know, when, when you're just going and skating, like time seems to fly by, but the minute you're like, oh, I think I'm going to learn Russian. Like t time is just like, whoa, right? <laughs> uh, so always find the, those novel things. That t Brian and I's teachers, we used to teach, we know to teach our kids that, please yeah. do novel learning. Um, Allison, what about you? Anything that you have like concerns about the future that you've set up for your future? Um, no, I really have not. Um, I have a financial advisor who has assisted me, especially ever since my husband passed. So I have uh, my retirement funds all settled and I'm, I should be good to go for as many, for as many years as my body, body will uh, hold, you know, hold up. Excellent. But I, I just wanted to say one more oh, thing yeah. because um, Brian mentioned exercise. You know, during the pandemic, you know, I know a lot of us have reached out, reached out and tried to do a lot of exercise because we know how good it is for us. But I came up with this thing I call 20 for 20. And you can do it whether you're in the house or whether you're in a class or whatever. But I do 20 reps of any 20 exercises that I can think of that wow. I can do safely in the oh. house. I like and that. Great. I just do 20 reps. I, and I actually wrote them down on a piece of paper. Brian, I had a chart similar to you. Um, I wrote them down on a piece of paper and every day I would just make sure I did 20 reps of each one of them. And sometimes I added more, I took some away, but that kind of kept me motivated because you have to keep yourself motivated. You know, it's, it's up to us to, to move ourselves. We can't wait for somebody else to push us. Right. Um, and, and along those, the, the lines of your question, uh, cause I just jumped on the exercise thing, but the uh, as Lily's disease got a little more progressive, our kids asked us to read this book, Being Mortal. Uh, and so we got it on audiobook Great. so we could le read and listen. And I comprehend a lot better that way with my cognitive struggles. And that's a book that discusses just where we are with our healthcare system now and, and things that need to change. But it opened up the discussion because our kids read it at the same time and they're in their 30s. And so we were able to have discussions on how to handle end of life before it came to that part. And so we were all at a good place when Lily's disease took the turn. Uh, and so I think that that's just a great way to just get you and your loved ones on the same page for your needs. And, and at the same time, also I've, I've told my kids, you know, because if, if, I have cognitive issues and I get tested every three years and I'm on two Alzheimer's medications. And I've said, if, if I start to go where I don't know things, you need to put me in a home. I do not want to be where, somebody in the family has to care for me and be a drain on them. Mm. Uh, and, yeah, and that's important to- It's implicit to get that conversation out there. Yeah. 
important and it's not it's not always a welcome conversation you know so you ease into it so i love that you got the book being mortal and yeah. read that together because that really puts a laser focus on things in the out you know in the outside and then you can bring it into well this is what mom and dad are dealing with and you engage with your your children or your parents or your siblings i think that's a wonderful idea thank you I told them it saved money. They could just put me on an iceberg and push me away, but they don't. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, I am sad that this hour has gone so quickly. Uh, I have a feeling that this, you know, we need more of these conversations because uh, I think there's a lot more to be discussed. Um, I do have one question that uh, for those of you who would like to answer, I'd love to hear about it. How are Parkinson's communities, uh, organizations failing you as a, a community of people who are living alone what are what could be done that's not being done where do you feel like you're not being served i think i think oftentimes people and it goes back to what um carrie was saying earlier so <clears throat> the way that they market things it gives people it gives people the wrong idea because it's not being inclusive so I wouldn't go as far as saying that they're failing us. And I think they're trying to come up and, and activities like this and discussions like this help, help the word get out. Because if we don't do this type of stuff, Parkinson's is going to look like a old, an older white man, you know, stooped over or having tremors. And that is so not true. So not true. <laughs> Or the scary new Plazid commercial where it's like they're having oh hallucinations. Oh my gosh, the FDA. How does they? It's like, so that I don't think my horrible. community, yeah, I don't think my community is failing me. I happen to live in a wonderful place with good resources and I'm like a detective. I'll find out and I share that with, because like Allison, I started a support group for young women. So I share it and, you know, I'm grateful for the foundations that support all of us. And I think, as Michael says, as long as we keep talking, keeping the, the conversation going, keeping the community aware, and then spreading the news to the non-Parkinson's peeps, because, you know, we know what it is. Everybody else needs to know what it is now. Right. Amen. Yeah, and that, that it's not just about shaking. The, Waking and shaking. I'm hipping and hopping every day. So much more I may be that. slow, yeah. but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. I think all the non-motor stuff that we can make awareness build awareness on the the better chance we have of our community really understanding what parkinson's is yeah. you know it's funny too because the cognitive aspect of the disease makes the physical part um come out more because if i get if i have any um i guess intense feelings it could be anger it could be sadness it could be excitement it makes it just makes it go crazy and it's just it's, i mean it's really really challenging it also affects me at work sometimes too, because if I'm going through and trying to take notes in, in a meeting, by the time I get back to my office, I can't even read, I can't even read my own writing. And I used to have fairly nice writing, but it's, it's kind <laughs> of tough now. That is frustrating, yeah. Right. Right. Mike, were you gonna say something? I say it, it just grows from within. It's up to us to, to try to develop what the, what the support system is gonna look like going forward. And I, you know, I, I almost got the feeling that that you know, your question was uh, what what's owed to me, but I feel like I've got to I've got to pay back what I've ever been given because I've been so blessed with the 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 support that we've gotten from the from the parties the organizations that we have now that we just we've been very lucky. So it's up to us to to involve our families and our friends and and to be open enough and open and honest enough and and to let our guard down to just realize that. Can all help each other out, but it's a ground, it's a groundswell. Yeah, so, I agree. So. And keeping your sense of humor and knowing you're not alone. We are all in this together. If you're not and, laughing, you're crying. Exactly. Oh, that's what I was saying. You're crying. And why cry? Make sure a little puffy. It eyes. takes much more energy to laugh, so why not exercise? So let's just laugh. <laughs> there you go. Hula hoop. Yeah. Uh, remember, <laughs> optimism well, is a choice. I'm sorry, Allison. Optimism is a choice. Right. Amen. Right. You can choose to be happy. Thank yep. all of you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. This is a long time coming and I know that our community is grateful. And uh, I think this will be the first of, of many that we get to talk about. Uh, we will be sending the 
audio, video, transcript to everybody. So just check out your um, email, probably be coming in the next week or so. And definitely send us questions if you have anything about this topic or any other topic that you would like us to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Mel. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You.